Thank you so much. Welcome to Surviving the Labor Crisis, the Urgent Case for Inclusive Leadership. Now, I know we spent a lot of time in our homes in 2020 and 2021, but if you've ventured out since then, you've probably seen a lot of help wanted signs in your neighborhood. Pretty much everybody everywhere is hiring, uh, with the exception of a few large uh, tech companies where we've seen some layoffs, but really... Uh, industry agnostic really across the entire economy we are seeing a labor shortage and so what i want to help you with today is how to not participate in this labor shortage how to overcome and adapt and so um amber if you would would you start with that first poll i want to see where folks are coming from and kind of how they are uh showing up So the first question is, how has the labor crisis affected your organization? Um, and your options are, we're trying to grow and it's hard to fill open positions. We are experiencing high turnover, especially among younger workers. We've seen an increase in retirements and therefore have lost institutional knowledge. All of the above or none of the above. So go ahead and give us your vote there on how the labor crisis has been affecting your organization. And I know some folks are still joining, so we may not get a very representative sample here early, but just to ground us in um, kind of where folks are coming from in your sector of the economy. Do we have any results coming in, Amber? Yes, they're slowly coming in. Excellent. So welcome to those of you who are just joining. We are uh, conducting a poll just to find out how your organization's faring in the current labor crisis. If you've had a help wanted sign up for a while, you are not alone. This is a, a problem, not just in the U.S., but globally. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll. The results are... 33% is we have seen an increase in retirements and therefore lost institutional knowledge. And 67% is all the above. All of the above. That's a lot of impact. Um, hard to fill open positions due to growth. Hard to fill positions during high turnover. Um, there's a lot of costs associated with high turnover. And we'll get to that today. And then this, this increase in retirements um, I think is playing a bigger part in the labor crisis than people realize. So for those of you who voted, I want to thank you for your honesty, for your candor, and for participating. And now let's get into what we're going to talk about today and how, how we might be able to help with some of these issues that you're seeing already. So our first, um, our first bit in our agenda is some data-informed research that unveils the real causes of the labor shortage. Um, I've heard a lot of people, a lot of people from everywhere, from in the airport to at my clients say, oh, people just don't want to work. And I just don't buy it. And I, I set out to actually find out why is there such a shortage? And so I want to really challenge this narrative of people not wanting to work. I don't think that people getting $1,200 during the pandemic um, inspired them to stay home and you know watch Netflix all day. I think there's some real demographic shifts that are happening that we can't be, um, we can't, we can't ignore. And so we'll talk about some of this research. What are the four factors um, accounting for 5 million missing workers in our economy? The second uh, learning objective today is to identify the hot, the five hidden costs of turnover. And uh, for those of you who are experiencing high turnover, you may know that there's a bottom line impact. You may not know how bad it is. And so not, not to put you in a state of panic, but it's good to understand kind of a full picture of what turnover might be costing you, especially if you're having trouble shifting leadership perspectives on how to respond to turnover. Third, we'll talk about seven essential skills for inclusive leaders. The reason inclusive leadership is such an important tool 
in combating the labor shortage is because turnover is so expensive and you can't possibly grow if you can't back if you can't even keep your count your headcount current right we can't expand headcount if we can't even keep our headcount current so having leaders that can relate to folks that can manage across difference that can help people feel connected to their teams to their leaders and to their work to the organization is critical for surviving this crisis and then i'll give you some final thoughts about where you might want to go next and how you can get a free copy of the book that all of this research is is in so i won't be sharing the slides out today uh, but you can download a digital copy of the book which I thought I had in front of me, but I do not. Hold on. There's a book, Surviving the Labor Crisis, The Urgent Case for Inclusive Leadership by me. And I'll tell you how to get a copy of that at the end. Before we get started, uh, I just want to see if there are any questions or any concerns top of mind. Feel free to use the chat or the QA feature throughout this session so that uh, we know kind of where, where you are, what you're thinking, and how we can target this to exactly what you were hoping to get out of it today. If you have any um, any questions or any learnings that you were hoping to take away from this, go ahead and put those in the chat now so I can you know, kind of customize my talk in real time and make sure that I'm hitting on the points that are the most important to you. While you're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and launch into some data-informed research. So late in Q1 uh, 2022, so this is a couple years old now, we started to hear about a significant worker shortage. And there was a report by CNBC at that time that showed that we had 5 million more open positions than we had people available to work. Meaning that if everybody who was looking for work got a job tomorrow, we'd still have 5 million open positions in this, com in this country. Um, and like I said, I've heard lots of people, including managers and retirees, say, oh, people are lazy. They don't want to work. And I just don't believe that's true. I, we've got four factors that we're going to dive into that will change this damaging lazy worker narrative and actually empower us to do something differently in our organizations. So the first piece of data that I think is really important for people to understand is back before the pandemic. Before 2020, if you can remember back that far, I know everybody's memory kind of got reset uh, March 13th of 2020. But prior to that, we had been having a lot of conversations in HR spaces and in economic uh, forecasting spaces about the retirement wave that was coming because baby boomers are aging out of the workforce. And there was, um, up until 2020, I will say, a lot of baby boomers were still hanging on, even though they were well past what we would consider a normal retirement age or a traditional retirement age of 65, even 67. The baby boomers have continued to age, but they didn't really start leaving in higher numbers, in the numbers that we expected to see uh, pre-pandemic until the pandemic hit. So, you know, we used to say, pre-pandemic, 10,000 new baby boomers every day were just one bad day away from retirement, um, that they could just decide on a whim to go. And, you know, a lot of people had a lot of bad days in 2020 and 2021. So even though we, we were maybe wondering, some of us Gen Xers were maybe wondering if the boomers would ever really retire, it started and it's, and it's picked up, it's increased. And so new retirees, this is not total, what you're seeing here is not total retirees each year, but this is new retirees over the previous year. So the increase in retirees more than doubled in 2020 over 2019. And those trends have continued. So we're seeing a lot of folks leaving the workforce. And remember, the baby boomers are the largest generation or were the largest generation in the workforce. So as they retire, we just don't have enough people coming up behind them to take on all of that work. What's What exacerbates that even further is the folks that are leaving are the ones that have the most institutional knowledge. So a lot of times when they go, it's not just that we're losing the productivity of that one worker. Other workers become less productive because they don't know who to ask. The people who are the experts have gone and they're in retirement and they are unreachable on their fishing boats and in their RVs. So we need to make sure that we are capturing as much knowledge as we can. Now. I told you there were 5 million missing workers. Just these extra workers 
or just these extra retirees is 3.2 million accounts for 60% of the missing workforce. So that's a big number. So when people say, oh, folks are lazy and they don't want to work, remind them that we had a lot of extra retirements in the past few years. Okay, the second major piece of that's contributing to the labor shortage is the drop in immigration during the pandemic. So you can see here kind of where the, the non-tourist visas, the new arrivals, right? These are working, people coming in on working visas, basically. These are folks who are here to work in the U.S. And we saw that number pretty steady, steady trend line up from 2000 to 2020, but then you see that number got cut in half in 2020 because the, everything was closed. People couldn't get in, um, they couldn't get approved. We had a, a lot of uh, slowdown economically. And so we really have cut our immigration numbers significantly. And that trend continued in 2021. I've not seen updated numbers for 22 and 23 yet, but if you consider that we were losing about a million people out of our workforce from immigration just in 2020 and then about another million in 2021, that more than accounts for the difference between the boomers retiring and the 5 million people we're missing, if you're following me. So if that doesn't make sense, let me know in the chat and I can kind of break this down a little bit differently. In 2021 and 2022, we started seeing another shift. And I've not been able to prove this yet, but I'm working on it, um, proving or disproving to see if I'm right. But service sector wages began rising pretty sharply um, in 2022 compared to previous trends. And while it may not sound like a huge difference to you that people were making instead of $8 an hour, $15 an hour uh, for the same work, that's a huge lifestyle difference for folks. And so what I believe has happened is that folks who were working service sector jobs, now this was pre-inflation, although I think wages are starting to catch back up with inflation now, but what happened was folks were working two minimum wage jobs, three minimum wage jobs just to make ends meet. When they basically got a 100% salary increase in 2022, they were able to shed at least one extra job. So where one person was occupying two or three jobs in the economy, especially in the service sector, now one person might only be occupying one or two jobs in the service sector, which I think is not necessarily contributing to a labor shortage, but maybe there's less masking of a labor shortage than we had in the past, right? So it's almost like we we got a view into what was really going on once wages went up. Now, again, we've had some inflation since then, and we'll see how these things level out. Um, but I would imagine that there are a lot of folks who not only are scaling back on their work hours due to increased wages, um, but also are probably, you know, spending a lot more of their discretionary time at home with their families. And then finally, I know everybody's tired of talking about COVID. We're in 2024 and we you know, would love to let this go, but we did lose a lot of folks to COVID-19. Um, we had you know, approximately a million Americans die and a quarter to a half of them were part of the labor force. These were people who were in the workforce that we lost. So a quarter to a half of a million people just gone from our workplaces, um, not just from our economy and our workplaces, but from our families and our communities. In addition to that, especially prior to the rollout of vaccines, a lot of people who contracted COVID got hit with long COVID. And so they became partially or... Uh, fully disabled as a result of complications due to COVID or long-term COVID infections. There's an estimate that as many as 8 million or more people are now newly disabled just due to COVID-19. Now, if you consider that as many as one in four people in the U.S. were already part of the disability community, whether they knew it or not, 
uh, whether they're collecting benefits or not, you add to that another 8 million people, that's a significant chunk of folks. Also, keep in mind, our population is aging, right? That, that biggest section of our economy is getting older. So not only are folks at the upper end of the age brackets retiring, they're also becoming disabled at higher rates than the general population. So we've seen a lot of new disability in the past four years, let's say. That necessarily takes people out of the workforce, either fully or partially, permanently or temporarily. It's also true that people with disabilities, even if they're looking for work, even if they want to work, struggle to find jobs that they're qualified for um, or that they are um, selected out of roles or not selected for roles because of their disabilities. So you can see that there's a lot of data working against us here in terms of keeping our, our labor pipelines, our talent pipelines full, keeping our, you know, keeping our productivity going, keeping our, um, our operations fully staffed. Any questions about the data before I move on to some recommendations based on this data? Okay, so I see uh, understanding the real impact of the aging and disabled is of utmost importance. What are some strategies that are being considered to meet this challenge? Perfect segue. I'll take it. Um, if you have any other questions, please put them in the chat. But here's some recommendations that I have. So the first is, if we don't understand the cause, we can't affect a good solution, right? If we assume that everybody's lazy, nobody wants to work, that really doesn't put us in a place where we can take action to make things better. So the very first thing I recommend is invest in knowledge transfer solutions and or create part-time roles for retirees. Retirees make up the biggest section of people leaving the workforce, and they also make up the biggest uh, the biggest uh, pool of institutional knowledge. So if we're not already capturing what they know, we need to do that before it's too late. There are tons of ways to do this. There are tons of folks who can help uh, with learning management systems, with knowledge management solutions, um, organizational you know, development programs, those kinds of things. But it's really important um, to engage folks pre-retirement because they are not going to want to come back once they figure out that they don't have to get up every morning, they don't have to put on hard pants, they can do whatever they want and start their day when they feel like it. So getting them back into the workforce is going to be almost impossible. But if we can if we can get as much from them and help them transition out um, in a good way for them and for our organizations, that can go a long way in helping us retain some of that knowledge and, and keep the productivity going even when they're gone. Second um, is to create more remote positions or partner with global staffing firms so that we can re-engage foreign workers. Remember, we don't have as many folks coming in uh, from outside the U.S. borders as we did pre-pandemic. And so sometimes, you know, we need to go find people in other places because we just don't have enough people here in the U.S. to do some of this work. Now, all politics aside, I'm just talking about, you know, demographic numbers, right? We we need people to do work. Um, we're going to have to expand our pool of who we hire, where we hire. I also encourage you not to overlook people in the U.S. who may work away from your corporate office. So um, I know we had, you know, really good remote work policies in 21, excuse me, in 2020, 2021. Uh, we're kind of on this return to work path or return to the office path now. Um, but keep in mind, having people work for you, only people who work for you who can be in your office limits you geographically as well. And there are a lot of folks in this country that aren't located near your office that might be very qualified for your work. So, so expanding kind of how we think about talent can make a huge difference as well. Um, the next piece, and we've seen some of this in the last couple of years, automate customer journeys or find innovative efficiencies. So if you've been to a fast food place or counter service restaurant lately, you've probably seen a lot more kiosks than order takers. Um, even in some of the sit down restaurants I've gone to, they've gone to tabletop kiosks for ordering or at least paying for your meal so that they can have fewer servers serving more, you know, more customers at a time. Um, so we're seeing a lot more automation in, in places where 
folks have been slow to automate in the past. And I think we're going to see more of that. I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing for the labor force, right? Because again, we don't have people to fill these jobs. We've got to do something. So um, having portions of tasks, portions of jobs automated so that we can focus our human capital where it's most needed, I think is going to be really effective and a great way to move forward. Next is we need to revamp our hiring processes and retrain our hiring managers. I can almost guarantee if you've got a hiring process, you've got bias in your hiring process. And if you've got bias in your hiring process, you are losing out on qualified candidates because you don't see their talent or your managers don't see their talent. And to have bias in your hiring process is basically the equivalent of taking half of the resumes that come in and shredding them without looking at them. Um, it is absolutely damaging, not just to your to your workforce, to your ability to innovate, to your ability to staff your teams, um, but it's also there's huge reputational cost to this. There can also be legal consequences and um, financial consequences as well. So Right now, if you haven't already, now, today is the time to revamp hiring processes and retrain hiring managers so that you are eliminating as much bias as possible from your hiring practices. Excuse me. I do an entire course on Hire Beyond Bias, and it is amazing all the places, every decision point along the hiring process where people might insert their own assumptions and lose qualified people. And keep in mind, there's a huge a huge workforce out there that we've not tapped into of people with disabilities, a lot of whom are trying to get work but don't get selected because hiring managers don't know how that would work for them. So we need to do more. That's on us. And then finally, and most importantly, <laughs> please hear me, invest in your existing employees to reduce turnover before it happens. If you have, you know, a revolving door on talent, you will never, ever, ever be able to recruit your way out of it. Doing so is, a, is the equivalent of just burning money in your office. Um, you will never out recruit high turnover. And so I'm seeing some thumbs up and some claps in the chat. So I'm happy about that. I'm glad that I'm hitting on um, on some hot button issues for you. Um, Amber, can you launch that second poll for me? I'd like to see where folks are in terms of how they're responding um, and how they're thinking about this crisis. So how is your organization responding to the labor crisis right now? Uh, trying to do more with less and stressing out our teams. Um, scaling black, back on client roster or product and service offerings, increasing technology investment, automation, robotics, AI, self-service, um, or outsourcing, offshoring, or temp labor. How are you all currently dealing with your labor shortage? And again, from the first poll, we're losing people uh, to retirement, losing their knowledge. We are uh, having trouble recruiting for growth. We're having trouble retaining workers, especially younger workers. So hopefully you've implemented some something so far to counter this. Amber, are we seeing any results come in yet? Yes, I'm going to give them a couple more seconds. Sounds great. Amber, in your role in IDC, are you seeing any of this happening? No. Yes. Doctor. Okay. Dr. Lee says yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lee, you want to come up and tell us about it? Can I speak? Yes, please. Oh, I didn't know that. I was trying to answer the poll. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What, what we're doing and the CEO has, has come on board, come off uh, on, on many occasions said the one thing we're not going to do is get rid of anybody, even during the downturn. So mm -hmm. we are required to do more. Amber is accustomed to working like crazy anyway, so she wouldn't notice it. That's just how she flows. But 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 yes, we are. And uh, I was, and uh, you, the things you asked, uh, and I didn't know I could have spoken. I could have spoke sooner about the numbers and the data is spot on, because we're looking constantly at who's leaving the workplace with no idea about the real impact of their departure. 
like you said, you hit on the thing that I like to talk about, and that is the knowledge that's leaving with the, with the with, with the baby boomers. We, and then, and I know you're going to mention it. I was going to put it in the chat. How AI factors into this, mm -hmm. because that's another level of bias that has to be dealt with more pragmatically. So absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I appreciate it. Okay, Amber, do you have any results for us yet? Yes, I do. Excellent. So a hundred percent said trying to do more with less, stressing oh. out. A hundred percent. Okay, so a hundred percent of you need to write down my email address. <laughs> uh, Amy at lead at any level com, and let's talk about this because this trying to do more with less is going to make your problem worse. Let's talk about why. All right, so. We've talked about data-informed research. We're going to talk about the five hidden costs of turnover. Here's what, ha what happens when you try to do more with less. So the first thing is when you've got empty seats, you can't deliver. Now, you don't have to be in the widget business to know that an empty seat affects productivity, right? Um, client project delays can damage your relationships. They can da damage your reputation. They can damage your ability to get paid. They can influence cash flow, right? Negatively impact cash flow. Even for internal projects, late delivery can have ripple effects on other departments, on product quality, on market share. When you have folks in public facing roles who have exited your organization, you've got empty public facing seats and open position there may limit your capacity to sell, to serve, or if you're in a hospital environment, even save lives, right? Um, when the open seat belongs to somebody in management or a leadership role, teams may suffer from a lack of direction or from feeling disconnected from the organization's mission. So these, these empty seats are impacting you. Even if you think you can do more with less, and we'll get to that in a minute, having an open position sit open for too long can really have um, lasting effects. Now, unemployment overall has hovered around three and a half percent for a couple of years, and that's well, well below full employment, right? So we are beyond full employment. We're into extra employment. And it's clear that the competition for talent is heating up. And so this is especially true. The industries that, that my organization primarily serves, healthcare, tech sector, insurance industry, where the um, unemployment rates have been at or around 2% for a couple of years. Um, in the insurance industry in particular, we're seeing like 1.7% unemployment, which means just about everybody in, in insurance is, that wants a job has one. Um, and there's lots of open roles to be filled. So what this means for hiring managers um, is that it's going to take longer and it's going to cost more to replace people who leave. And you've probably seen some of that already. Um, and then even after you hire the replacement, let's face it, you're not going to hire someone, someone on Monday and have them fully functioning, uh, hundred percent productive in the role on Tuesday. It just doesn't work that way. It takes time for them to learn the role, learn the systems, learn the organization, learn where the bathroom is and how to log into their account, right? This all takes time. And so you can't expect people to be up and running right away. Um, even once you get somebody in the seat, there's, you know, a million moments of truth to keep them there and to get them productive. The second piece of this is recruiting costs money and time. So when a role needs to be fill filled, let's think about all the steps that have to happen. Somebody, usually a recruiter, has to find candidates for the job. Now, you may have internal recruiters that do that, and they're paid a salary by your organization, or you may have external recruiters that you're paying, but either way, that's money, and it's time. Um, it's not an insignificant amount of time to write a job posting, redo, review resumes, screen candidates, schedule interviews, follow up, negotiate offers, verify references, you know, <laughs> negotiate drug testing, conduct background checks, right? This stuff all takes time. And even, even employer brand building, putting jobs, uh, booths at job fairs, um, position listing on job boards, you know, advertising on job sites, that all costs real money. That stuff does not come for free. And then the applicant tracking systems, once you attract people to even apply, not just installing, but managing, upkeeping, monitoring, coordinating an applicant tracking system also costs money. Now we think about that's just on the recruiting side. Now you talk about the team, right? 
hiring managers, tech leads, people who are in uh, roles where they're helping with selection, right? So you may have three or four levels of management. You may also have individual contributors who now have to prioritize and schedule interviews with their teams who have to figure out, hopefully, how they're going to evaluate candidates. Excuse me. You know, multiple interviews times multiple candidates becomes a lot of time sunk into this process. And then once you get them in, again, you've got all this time from your team helping them onboard. So you've got to have somebody walk them through, like, what does day one look like? And how do they get logged in? And where do they go for computer, you know, uh, tech support? And, you know, how do they access their benefits plan? And all of that, that all takes a tremendous amount of time, money, and resources. And that's a lot of times, you know, kind of factored into the cost of turnover. But I don't know that we always see it when we think about, you know, it costs 30% of a person's salary to replace them, right? The next one, and this is something that I think, I think we don't quantify at all um, in, in popular conversations. Um, sorry, I'm checking the chat. I'm seeing a lot of, oh, yes. Um, and that is when employees leave, they leave for a reason. And they usually don't leave quietly right? They may not tell their manager why they're leaving, or they may not give their manager a heads up. But chances are the people that work with them know they're looking, know why they're looking, know where they're looking, and know when they plan to go. And then something really horrible happens, and you've all seen it. You log into LinkedIn, and there's your, your coworker who just left, and they're posting on LinkedIn about how great their new opportunity is and how much they love it there. And they've got a picture of their desk with all their new uh, branded corporate swag and a picture of their welcome luncheon and everyone's happy and smiling. And what happens? Everybody on the team goes, oh, man, that looks nice. It's been a long time since I felt recognized, since I got any branded swag, since anybody took me to lunch and asked me about my life. Because uh, we're all too busy here trying to fill the gap of the people that left, right? And so what I call this is greener grass syndrome. And, you know, we're fairly familiar now with how uh, contagious viruses spread. Uh, greener grass syndrome is contagious. You might lose one person and another person starts thinking, oh, man, that looks pretty good. Maybe I ought to go too. But the more people that this happens to, the more people who get infected with it. And it becomes its own problem. It feeds on itself. And so, you know, eventually you've got one person sitting there doing 23 people's work going, what did I miss? Why am I still here? You know, what did I miss out on if I didn't go? So keep this in mind. It's not just the people leaving. It's the people who stay that are looking. Oh, and this is the big one right here. This is the one um, that 100% of you said you're doing right now to combat this problem. And that is just shift the burden to the people that are there. So in addition to you've got empty seats not delivering, so there's more work, you know, there's work not getting done, which causes increased pressure. Now we're trying to take on additional work to cover for the people that are gone. Then we've got to do work to try to hire, select, onboard the new person coming in. That's another responsibility. We're still doing part of their job while we're onboarding them. And we're seeing our buddy who just left for our competitor. Living it up on LinkedIn. <laughs> this is a problem. This is a huge problem. This contributes to burnout. It contributes to depression, anxiety, tempers flare, conflict increases. The work environment can really, you know, the, co the uh, culture can really take a tumble in moments like this. Because when people are, are dealing with too much change, too fast, not enough resources, stress levels elevate, conflict ensues. I don't know anybody who wants to work in an environment like that. And you're competing with Jim Bob on LinkedIn who just got new corporate swag, right? So keep that in mind. And then finally, um, there's this bit about reputation among job seekers. So if you've got high turnover consistently over time, folks tend to notice, especially in industries where you are I don't want to use the word I wanted to use. <laughs> Let me think of another word where you've almost got a closed ecosystem, if you will, um, in terms of your workers, right? So I can think of some cities in particular, like I live in Indianapolis, 
tech workers in Indianapolis is sort of a closed system, right? Everybody's worked with everybody. Everybody knows where everybody is and everybody knows what's going on at everybody else's company. Okay. And so if you're in an industry like that or in a city or a region like that, especially, and you're constantly posting open positions, people start to notice. If you've got the same role that comes open, the same VP role that comes open every 18 months, right? If you've got the same, um, you know, sales manager role that comes open every 12 months, if you've got the same, right, all of these people are watching. And when they're out there looking for jobs, if they see the same job posted, excuse me, over and over and over again, they're going to start to wonder what's going on over there. Because remember, we're not just interviewing candidates and, and selecting candidates for our workforce, the candidates are selecting the company that they want to give their time, talent, and resources to. And so we need to be careful about what image are we projecting. So in summary, in this talent environment, the less turnover you have, the better. The more you can do to prevent turnover in the first place, the less it's going to cost you. Um, and so I have a lot of people, you know, I do advisory services, training, assessments around diversity, inclusion, and inclusive leadership. And I have folks come to me all the time who say, you know, we really want to do a better job of recruiting, especially recruiting diverse talent. Um, this is a problem for our organization. How can we do better? And I always ask them, first thing I ask them is, how are you keeping the people you've got? What are you doing to keep people? Because if you don't have talent staying. If you've got more people going out than you've got coming in, there is no point in recruiting, right? I can fill up a bucket with water all day long, but if I've got multiple holes in that bucket, that bucket is never going to get full. And it's better for me to do some work patching up that bucket and then put water into it. You get me? 90% of executives and HR leaders, 90% are worried about turnover right now. And for good reason. Um, and I would say, you know, if if the corporate strategy for surviving the labor crisis is, well, we'll just do more with less, eventually you're going to have more than you can do with with less than you can do it with. And this is going to be a problem. So, you know, seek, there's help out here, right? There are people that can help with this. Uh, seek us out because <laughs> you want to keep your employees and you want to keep them engaged. And I'm going to... I want to give you this thought, just especially if you're losing younger workers, if you're losing diverse talent out of your organization, the future of the workforce looks exactly like the people who are leaving today. If you can't keep them today, you will not be able to attract them tomorrow. So you've got to figure out how to keep folks. Okay. All right. Any questions, comments, anything that we uh, that we need to to double click on before we move on? I know there was a question about AI, um, and I'll address that while you all are putting questions in the chat or in the Q and A. Um, I am not an AI expert, um, but it is clear to me from the little bit that I've used AI that I've interacted with it, and from what I've read, that yes, AI is basically an accelerator to feed our biases back to us. And so anything, you know, depending on how we phrase the question um, can make all the difference in the answers that we get back. But even if we phrase the question perfectly, artificial intelligence engines, machine learning engines are trained on data and all existing data is already biased. All existing everything is already biased because it comes from people originally. And so there's no escaping this. So we have to not, we can use AI by all means. I think it's going to become more and more important that we use AI, but we need people who are trained to recognize the bias in the algorithms and the results so that we can take what we get out of these algorithms and transform them into something better than what we've had in the past. AI will not be able to innovate, uh, innovate uh, for us or innovate our way out of bias. Dr. Lee, you had something to add. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I, I can see Amber laughing at me as we speak because she'll tell you. There's a book 
that I can recommend that talk specifically about what you just said, Amy, and it is spot on. And I think most people, re unfortunately, I think people think the things that are out there are going to fix people problems, and they can't. It's a people on people um, requirement that, that, has to, that has to deal with the problem we're creating. And you mentioned something else in the presentation. I know you have more to do, and I don't want to hold you up. But if, if you're working at a company and they don't realize that we're living in an age now where people development is, is going to be a key part of allowing you to maintain that talent that you spoke about in this, in this quote. That's why I said that's profound. Because you're right. The very people that's going to be required for sustainability are the people who are leaving in masses. And I don't think anybody's really thinking about what's required to keep them there. Now, th that was a question that's going to be a part of a challenge. And I'm, I'll stop here. How, does, how do we... How do we um, how do we bring on the extra people that you need, and you're operating in a uh, smaller company where you know where resources are, you know, money specifically are at a are at a, a premium? And I'll put the book, the name of the book, in the chat, Keisha, in just a sec. But th that that would be another challenge if you can yep. speak. To Absolutely. So I actually have some resources for that too. Um, so thank you for that. It's almost. I, and Dr. Lee, you've not seen this presentation before, correct? No, no, I okay, haven't, no. Because <laughs> you keep asking the question that leads me right to my next thing. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I love it when a plan comes together. Okay. So we have talked about, uh, and thank you for that. We've talked about data-informed research on why we don't have people in our companies. We've talked about hidden costs of turnover that are making it harder for us to do the work that we need to do. Now we're going to move into the seven essential skills for inclusive leaders. And I think I will come back to a little bit of this, uh, Dr. Lee, but uh, I think this will answer some of your question and also your concern about, but, but are we training people? And the answer is no, most companies are not training people. So let's talk about what this looks like. <laughs> All right, so poll number three, um, Amber, if you wouldn't mind putting that up for us, this one will be fun. Although I'm a little scared of the results after what we saw last time. All right. How does your organization support emerging and aspiring leaders? Your options are, number one, we train on leadership skills before we even promote them to management. Number two, we train new managers within a year or two of being promoted. Number three, we assume new managers will figure it out eventually. Or number four, does LinkedIn learning count? And I am curious as to how um, how you all are managing right now. How are you supporting your emerging and aspiring leaders in your organization? Here's what I know to be true. Uh, there are a lot of folks who are high potential in your organization. You've got to probably, I'm going to guess, regardless of what organization you're in, about 20% of your people are high, are high potential, right? Um, possibly more than that, but you've probably identified 20% that are high potential in your organization. And here's the thing, high potential employees are not necessarily born with the skills that they need to be inclusive leaders who can lead diverse teams effectively. I'm gonna say this again, high potential employees are not necessarily born with the skills that they need to lead diverse teams effectively. And before I move on from that, I'm curious, Amber, do we have poll results? 100% said, oh, no. we, assume, <laughs> we assume new managers will figure it out eventually. <sighs> okay, I'm gonna take a deep breath on that one. I appreciate, make... yes. <laughs> I, I, I said, I said, you're about to make a lot of money, Amy. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I hope that's true for two reasons. Uh, the primary one is I really want to be a resource for helping change some of this, because even though I can't see you all, I can, I can feel the pain that you're putting into your survey responses, right? Like we've got all the problems. I mean, poll number one was what problems do you have? And and two thirds of you said, we've got all the problems. 
We're tr struggling to attract, we're struggling to retain, and we're losing institutional knowledge. And so, first of all, there's a lot of pain there, right? We are dealing with a lot of problems all at once. The second thing was, oh, and by the way, we've got to do more with less. We are not staffed for this. We are not prepared. We don't have the tools that we need. And now I'm hearing, oh my gosh, we don't even train our leaders. So I want you to think about that. You're trying to do more with less and you're asking untrained leaders to lead that effort. This has got to be painful for y'all. And so really, I want to help. And uh, I see a question. In healthcare, we promote good clinicians versus leaders. How do we change this? So that's a big question. And I'll give you two answers. Um, the first is you have you have two options and they're not mutually exclusive. You can do both at the same time. The first is that you you change your rubric, right? You change your metrics or your your criteria for who gets promoted. And you have to do that very broadly, right? That's kind of an across the board effort. It kind of, you know, kind of got to work it up and out and down. Um, that's part one, um, adjusting the criteria for who gets promoted. Part two, though, is recognizing that these are skills, leadership skills, inclusive leadership skills are skills, just like drawing blood is a skill, just like driving a car is a skill, just like changing oil is a skill, just like Excel spreadsheets are a skill. These are skills. People don't have to be born with them to learn how to do them effectively. But the odds of them figuring it out on their own are pretty slim. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about what skills are essential for inclusive leaders. Um, so in 2022, there was a Gartner survey that revealed that 91% of HR leaders are concerned about employee turnover. We talked about that before. Um, and CEOs and CFOs know that turnover limits growth and undercuts profits. And we've talked a little bit about some of those costs. So here's what I think all leaders need to know at a bare minimum. This is like... Um, if you were going to take, you know, if you were going to go to school for an MBA and you need like a basic math course before you can start the accounting courses, these are like the basic math courses. That makes sense. So the first one is we need leaders to see the big picture. We need them to understand what I'm talking about today, which is we can't wait. Inclusive leadership cannot wait. This is costing us a ton of money. It is costing us a ton of talent. It is costing us market share. It is costing us opportunity with our clients. Um, cost, 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 right? If we want to be a sustainable company, if we want to, if we want to keep the, the doors open and the lights on, we got to figure this out sooner than later. And so a lot of leaders still don't understand why diversity and inclusion is important. They don't understand the need for it. Um, but the truth is that inclusive leaders can positively impact every single aspect of company performance. Everyone, from sales to marketing to supply chain, from operational efficiency to talent retention, in every single one of these categories and more, inclusive organizations enjoy sustainable competitive advantage. They are able to outcompete longer because they have the talent and the resources they need to do it. And so inclusive leaders need to know that they can drive bottom line results, um, identify bottom line benefits of leading inclusively, understand the costs associated with doing business as usual, and understand the strategies they need to build that competitive sustainable advantage. Now, you don't have to write all this down. I'm going to give you the link to the free book that gets you all of this information. Every, almost every word I'm saying is in this book somewhere or, or loosely translated from, okay? So don't feel like you have to write everything down. But we got to get leaders to see the big picture here and why this matters. Otherwise, they won't engage in anything else. The second piece we need to understand is that every industry is changing more rapidly than it ever has before, your industry included. And this, bring, you know, this brings a barrage of discussion about disruption, agility, resilience. Leaders and professionals who can adapt quickly can seize new opportunities and manage their careers and their organizations better, right? In every challenge, there's an opportunity if we can find it, but we don't always give people the tools they need to find the opportunity in the change. So people need various models for understanding 
personal and organizational change. They need techniques to identify and overcome fear, resistance, and uncertainty. They need to be prepared, not just for the changes they're experiencing today, but they need to start thinking about and planning for changes that have not hit them yet. Uh, and they need action plans for all of this. So this is such an important component. And for those of you who are DEI professionals who are here, which I assume is most of you, um, DEI is a change initiative. So if you think about this, if people are not, um, if people don't deal well with change in general, right, any change can be disruptive, any change can be, you know, a problem for folks. And people don't deal well with change in general, and they don't have a process for managing change in general. And then we bring in a DEI initiative, and we're trying to transform a culture from a DEI lens. Now you're asking people not just to adapt to change, with their, which they're not good at, you're specifically asking them to adapt to change that threatens their judgments, their values, their identity, and their lived experience in a lot of cases, not in every case. Some folks are clamoring for this, but it's usually not the folks in charge. And so you're asking them to challenge all of that and navigate change at the same time. And we've not even given them the tools to navigate simple changes effectively. So this is critical. Um, the next piece is building relationships across difference. So we had a question earlier about what about small organizations that can't hire everybody that they need to hire or they can't afford expensive consultants? Here's the thing. Every single person can have a network and every single person who has a network needs to have a network that is diverse, robust and inclusive. And that's not something that most people focus on. We take for granted that that's going to happen by by accident or by default. And the truth is, it just doesn't. Um, I wrote a book in 2018. Some of you may be familiar with called Network Beyond Bias. And Network Beyond Bias is all about why our networks tend to look exactly like us if we don't intervene and what we can do about it. So we need to we need leaders who understand how unconscious bias affects their decision making, how they can incorporate inclusive behaviors and effective networking strategies. Because let's face it, every job for people from a people perspective, every job you're ever going to get. Maybe except for the first one you get out of high school or the first one you get out of college. Every job you're ever going to get is going to come from your network. But here's the thing. Every opportunity that you're going to give is going to go to your network. And so if we want to change the flow of opportunity, we have to be intentional about our networks. And then finally, um, we need, and I, I offer this in the book, Network Beyond Bias, um, we need to assess repeatedly and consistently assess the breadth and depth of our own professional networks so that we can hold ourselves account accountable for modeling this behavior. Ah, so we're, we're three of like <laughs> the, of the, of the foundation of the seven. So the fourth is play to your strength. And um, full disclosure, I'm a, I'm a Gallup certified strengths coach. The reason I'm a Gallup certified strengths coach is not because I wanted to be a coach, but because I wanted to teach teams how to leverage strengths-based leadership and strengths-based development. Um, I have coaches on my team, but I don't personally coach. And the, the reason it's so important to have a strengths-based model, we tend to hire people for their strengths and evaluate them on their weaknesses. And we've got to stop this. This is why we're losing people. We hire them for the one thing they bring to the team that we don't already have. And then when we give them a bunch of work that has nothing to do with that thing that we hired them for, and then we beat them up because they're not great at it. And we've got to do a better job of matching people to the work that fuels and feeds and fulfills them so they can be as productive as possible. Get rid of this notion of having well-rounded people because that's not a thing. Nobody can be good at everything. Um, and get to well-rounded teams that complement each other. So we really want leaders who can understand uh, strengths-based leadership concepts, can understand why strengths-based leadership can increase engagement and improve performance, who understand their own strengths but and can see other people's strengths, but who can also invest in and pull on those threads of strength in their teams so that they are able to get the most out of the folks that they've got. If you want to do more with less, this is the only way to do it, by the way. Oh, and then fifth is serving up feedback. So how do we give feedback that is equitable, 
and effective, but also how do we receive feedback in a way that doesn't shut it down in the future? And so I use a four-step process called BITE that helps people give you know, positive feedback, constructive feedback, but then there's also a system for receiving positive feedback so that we don't shut it down and receiving constructive feedback so that we don't shut that down. Because if we can't do, if we can't have feedback loops in both directions, right, coming and going, we can't grow individually or as an organization. And let's be clear, feedback is not equitable in most organizations. Women, uh, black and brown employees, remote employees tend to get less feedback than their white male able-bodied counterparts who are in the office sitting next to the manager all day. So we need to do a better job of this. Um, the way I equate this is if you had five houseplants and you only watered one of them and you only put one in the sun, you can't get mad when the, at the other four for not growing. But we're doing that on our teams every single day. So we've got to get better about that. Um, I mentioned this before, but hire beyond bias. Our hiring processes are, are fraught with opportunity for accidentally excluding people that we shouldn't. Um, so we need to recognize the barriers to inclusion. We need to remove restrictive language for our job postings. We need to find ways to mitigate, understand and mitigate our biases during the hiring process. And then we need some objectivity around how do we navigate this process and how do we, you know, implement tiebreakers and, you know, who gets the final say um, before we start. Because the very worst thing that can happen is we have all these criteria in place and then we go out, you know, we have an interview with somebody and we're like, man, I really like that guy. I'm going to hire that guy. With, you know, we're not, we're not auditioning for role of best friend, right? We need somebody to do a job. And so those objective criteria and really getting out of our own way there is what's going to get us there. And then finally, last one, I promise, is how do we create ongoing professional development and growth in our culture that helps everyone move forward together and that recognizes and celebrates risk-taking and growth, even if we're not successful every time. Um, and so this is something that, you know, I know a lot of people say, well, our learning and development budget is really low. There are so many things you can do. I, I hate to say this as a learning and development professional, but there's so many things that you can do that are free, that are very inexpensive and that, um, can really go a long way. If you are creative and scrappy and you've got dedicated people, um, you can go a long way creating a growth culture, a growth mindset within your culture. So that's what I've got in terms of what the bare minimum of what your leaders need. And a spoiler alert on the quiz, I said, does LinkedIn learning count? It does not. And here's why. There are thousands of courses on LinkedIn learning. No two managers are taking the same two courses. So you don't have any common vocabulary. You don't have any common approach. Um, and you don't have like a corporate or a company approved way of leading, right? Everybody's just sort of figuring it out as they go. There's no consistency and that doesn't build a culture. Uh, the two books I mentioned um, were Network Beyond Bias. This was a question that came in. Sorry. Network Beyond Bias by me. And Higher Beyond Bias by me. I do read books that I didn't write. Um, and I would also say there's a book called Play to Your Strengths or Now Discover Your Strengths. Um, but you can get there with the book. Can somebody help me out with the name of the book, the Strengths Finder book? I think it's Strengths Finder 2.0 is the name of the book. Um, so there you go. Those are in the chat. Okay. Um, so I promised you one to get out of here on time. So let me do that real quick. All right. So we talked about data informed research, why this is a problem. You all are experiencing all the problems and I'm so sorry. Uh, why turnover is costing you more than you think. What your leaders need to know at a minimum to move forward. And they really need this training. They need it to come from the organization. It can't be something that they go and do on their own. They need cohort based training so that they are together figuring out how do they take best practices from outside the organization and apply them in the context inside the organization. Um, and so just keep that in mind. Like this really needs to be a coordinated effort internally. Um, I offer all the courses that I just told you about or all the, the topics that I just told you about, I offer in a bundle and I'm happy to share that with you. Um, and I think um, 
you'll get my contact information in the notes at the end, um, but I can put my email in the chat as well. Um, so some final thoughts. Um, okay, and there's a question about signed copies of my books. Yes, I can do that. Just email me at, if you're wanting to get signed copies of any of my books, just email me at lead at any level.com and I'll figure out how to do that. Um, there's an old adage in business, coaches and consultants and people like me like to say, finish this in the chat if you can, if you do what you've always done, do you know the end of this? If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. Do you, have you ever heard that? I don't buy it. I don't buy it. And here's why. Let's talk about what's changed in business in the last 20 years or in the last five years. Your customer needs have changed. Your products and services have changed. Your markets and marketing have changed. Your regulations have changed. Your talent pool has changed. Your technology has changed. Your inter internal processes have changed. Now, if you were to hire a marketing person, a marketing professional executive who said, you know what? We're going to do marketing the way we've always done it. We're going to put an ad in the yellow pages and that'll be the end of it. You wouldn't keep that person for a minute and a half. You just wouldn't. Because nobody opens the yellow pages. Nobody's opening the yellow pages and calling your business so that they can come talk to you. It doesn't work that way anymore. Marketing has changed significantly, right? Just in five years time. The problem is our leadership has not changed to keep up with the times at a similar pace. We are still trying to lead people like we did 40 years ago. And it doesn't work because people are different. And the market is different. And the economy is different. Everything is different. So here's what I offer you. If you do what you've always done, you are in for a rude awakening. Sorry, let me go back. If you do what you've always done, you are in for a rude awakening. Because the old ways do not work. And so I want to thank you all for your time and attention. And I will hang out. I'm sorry, I went one minute over. I will hang out for a little bit for Q&A. If there are any unanswered questions, please put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A. Um, my email address, I believe, is in the chat now. So if there's anything that I can do for you, if you'd like to work with a phenomenal uh, team, a database, a data-driven, um, eclectic, diverse expert team, Lead at Any Level is here to serve you, and I would love to talk to you um, to help alleviate some of the pain y'all are feeling in your organizations right now. It is... It's a lot, and I'm sorry. <laughs>